Dreams with Jesus Ministries here. May the Lord bless all of you and equip you to be faithful in Christ Jesus. Hopefully we, we get a chance to effectively communicate some very, very important truth. And I, I'll do my best to... Oh, there goes my notifications. I'll do my best to ensure that uh, it's a baby coming. Um, I'll do my best to make sure that uh, I, can't, I, I just get in what it is that is necessary to be communicated. All right, so um, in prayer today, I at a couple a couple times I saw what I would describe as military devices military devices okay so military devices and I knew that these devices were a warning of future destruction uh, destruction against the ungodly nations. So I was talking with one of the brothers today and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, learning how to communicate the, 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 the importance of communicating, the significance of communicating something that, that will be hard to hear yet something that needs to be said so that there is no failure because it is true that when you don't hear what you need to hear you are being positioned to fail so when I don't say to you if the Lord says something to me because God picks and chooses what to say and with whom to speak all right and all of us hear from God at a fundamental level but then the Lord begins to decide who's going to hear more of what he has to say generally or concerning a specific matter and so the Lord promised to send prophets wise men and scribes throughout the nations to ensure the nations would hear the voice of God and obey it. The Word of God says, how can they hear except there be a preacher? The Word of God also says, the Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Uh, and, and, and so the Spirit of God sets people up to speak His Word and to speak it with clarity and to call forth or to cause His plans to be executed so the people of God when they speak the Word of God the plans of God are executed because the people are the instruments by which God wants to execute much of what it is he has to say that stated I saw military devices and I also saw a the hat of a military official uh, the closest thing to it would be the way that the Chinese, their hats, their military hats, the ones that have the, the, I don't know what you call it, but the, the bill. The bill with the flat circular part here, and I just saw that. But before that I saw a large green military device, and I knew that the Spirit of God was warning about pending danger pending war so people need to understand that our decisions affect our future individually and as a nation so the decisions that you make determine what happens to you individually but also as a nation all right so when we make decisions in individually those individual decisions become corporate decisions 
So this guy makes a decision, that person makes a decision, that person makes a decision. If the society is full of people who are making decisions for essentially the same reasons, pride, fear, lust, rebellion. If people are making a variety of decisions for the same essential reasons, well then that becomes the identity of those people. And once the people solidify uh, an evil identity, then the Lord will warn the people to turn from their decision making to turn to him so that the consequences of natural disaster, the consequences of famine and economic collapse, the consequences of war and violence, the consequences of disease can be removed. So God does not want to bring war. God does not want to bring disease on a nation or on a people. God does not want to bring economic collapse or poverty or famine or drought, uh, shortage. God does not want to do that, nor does God want to bring um, uh, famine or natural disaster or disease or whatever. So God doesn't want to do that. The Word of God very plainly says that He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says that very, very plainly in a number of ways and, 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 and multiple times. So multiple times the Lord says, it does not make me happy to hurt you. Multiple times, that's what the Spirit of God wants you to know. It does not make him happy to hurt you, to destroy you, to cause weeping, to cause mourning, to cause shock and amazement. It is not the desire of God. The Word of God says he does not willingly afflict. He does not willingly afflict. But the fact that people cannot associate their decision-making with the affliction is what brings about the affliction. So Ecclesiastes chapter 8 says, Because sentence against an evil work isn't executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. So, because there's a gap in time between the bad decision and the consequence, people have a, and I'm going to say something that I think is an actual word, there's, okay, so I'm going to say the word and I'm probably going to re, re, restate it. Dis, dis associative disorder. Disassociative. That's been coming to mind and I don't know if that's a real word. The inability to associate, the, the inability to associate because you've got spiritual disorders and physical disorders, all right? You've got spiritual disorders and physical disorders. Now, an easier way of saying disassociative disorder or associative disorder, but fine, we'll just stick with disassociative disorder because that's what's been coming to mind for the past few weeks. The inability to associate the consequence with the cause. Confusion. The inability to associate the consequence with the cause. And so now we are out here attempting to treat the symptoms and to stop the consequence. You need to stop the bleeding. You need to know why you are bleeding. So it's not just about defending yourself militarily. You need to know why these problems are, are reoccurring. So, confusion and ignorance through disobedience prevents us from knowing why we are experiencing the suffering we are experiencing. So there's a disorder, there's an inability, there's a spiritual inability to connect what's happening to us with, with the decisions that we are making, essentially because of a lack of faith. We essentially, many of us just do not believe God. So when God says do this, and we don't want to do that, we are positioning ourselves to suffer. And it doesn't matter when, it doesn't matter how 
you are going to experience unforeseeable consequences because God said do this and you did that so the sons of God by the grace of God are not ordained to wait for the consequence as a lifestyle now sometimes you're just not going to have the humility to obey sometimes we just don't have the humility to obey so as sons of God he brings about the consequence in measure but because we don't have that disorder the sons of God don't have that disassociative disorder we don't have the confusion at least not the degree of it we're not as confused the sons of God are being taught no a blessing if you obey and the, and the curse if you disobey and not only are the sons of God being taught because everybody's being taught the sons of God are given the capacity to believe it like no no I don't just know I don't just hear it I believe it praise God amen hallelujah so I don't just I don't just hear the truth I believe it that's the blessing of being a son of God you don't just hear it you actually believe it and 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 so when you believe it you obey the instruction and you don't wait for the consequence you don't that's not your normal way that's not commonly what you do you don't commonly wait for the consequence you you do what you're told and you expect blessing and when you don't do what you're told the fear of God comes upon you and you are mindful that that decision is, is, is connected to, is associated with this, with, with something God will do. I don't know what God will do to bring me back into to alignment. I don't know what open door to the devil that decision just gave. The, the word of God in Ephesians, Paul preaches and Paul says, uh, not to, he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So if you act in anger, if you are harboring anger or if you act, if you make a decision that you're not supposed to make. There's another scripture that says, he that breaks a hedge, a serpent will bite him. What does that mean? If there are standards that God has set for me and I reject those standards, I ignore those standards. If I break a hedge, a serpent will bite me. What does that mean? That means that God has set some laws for me, but on the other side of those standards are entities that are there to keep me in line, to attack me in the event that I want to cross the, ba the barriers and the boundaries that God has set for me. So God has set this barrier for me. I want to jump the fence. I want to kick against the fence. I want to break down. I want to have a hole in the fence so I can go through, steal things, and come back inside. But on the other side of that fence, on the other side of the Word of God, there is a serpent. There are entities designed to cause a measure of suffering to encourage you to obey. Oh, that's why God wanted me to obey. Because he has set up a structure of blessing and righteousness that if I don't yield to, then there's a destruction associated with doing things that don't represent him, that don't reflect him, that don't reveal him. So we're supposed to reveal God. We're supposed to. So when the Lord tells us what to do, it's because he is expressing himself through man and through man's works. When God says, do this, it's because God wants to do something that communicates holiness, righteousness, love, power. And so he rewards you for obeying because it reveals him as he actually is. If you do something, it's like burning fat. You, you, you may not want to look a certain way. You may want to burn fat. You may want to shave. You may want to, you know, get rid of a dark spot on your body. And there's some treatment measure that you want to go through. You may have some bacteria in your body that you want to get rid of. Absolutely. If there's something in your body, on your body, if there's something in your life that you know prevents you from being your best, prevents you from being strong, prevents you from prospering in a material sense, if you know that there's something in your life that hinders you from being exactly who you want to be, you're going to fight against it. Oh, I want to burn fat. I want to get rid of dark splotches. I want to get rid of 
any financial drain, if that's a life financial liability, I want to get rid of it. Absolutely. So we want to protect what's good and we want to we want to reject what's bad. And so we get that because we are designed like God by God. God designed man to be like him. And so essentially we are ordained to walk uprightly, to be faithful, to to be governed by the fear of God. Yeah, so you are supposed to be controlled by the love of God, the fear of God, the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God. And that communicates God, that expresses God, that reveals God. God chooses to be revealed through you. And so when you let God reveal himself through you, and by let, I mean obey. When you submit yourself to God, when you do what God tells you to do, then God is seen through you. When you don't do what God tells you to do, Jesus said, either you are with me or you are against me. Either you are for me or you are against me. And so, and he said, he that is not gathering with me, if you are not causing creation to reflect God and to work as God would have it work, if that's not what you're doing, then you are working against society, against life, against God, and then you become a target. You get put on the chopping block. So the Lord tells us what to do because he wants us to know or because he wants us to represent him. He wants us to express him, to exhibit him, to reveal him. To He wants to engage with us. God loves his sons and daughters. He loves mankind. You can tell he loves us by the natural creation. He deeply loves mankind. And so he tells us what to do in order to maintain fellowship, communion, oneness, unity with him. And, and, and so everything that he says is because we are designed to be with him. We are designed to be like him. And we are designed to work on his behalf. And, and if we don't do what we are called of God to do, then there are problems. We, we don't know when those problems are going to occur. And we're not supposed to mock God or tempt God and behave as though we think the consequences are not going to occur. We don't, we're not going to wait until the consequences come before we recognize the fact that Jesus, that Jesus wants us to do something. And if we don't do it, then we're going to miss out on something good and encounter something bad. No, we're not going to wait. We don't want to wait. Why? Why? So, so why are we tempting God when we do certain things? Why are we thinking that we don't have to do what he tells us to do? And if he's not going to judge us or, or afflict us or correct us or punish us, then we're going to just do bad things. We're going to be godly people in one sense, but be bad people in another sense. Because, well, he's not responding. He doesn't really care that I listen to this or watch that or say this or spend time with the, those people over there. He doesn't really care. So so I, I'll serve him when it's convenient. And then when it's not convenient, I'll fulfill ungodly desires. And, and, and because he's not going to react either way. I told you when I was in 10th grade, I was about 15. Yeah, 15 years old, 10th grade, I had an algebra teacher an algebra teacher, and I, I, I regret to inform you that Brother David did not have a good math career in high school because the teachers that I had were n many times just not doing the work. They just weren't teaching the first. So that's neither here nor there. But in 10th grade, I had, a ma I had a math teacher, an algebra teacher, and he was going to give me a C in the class no matter what I did. If I did the work, he was going to give me a C. I would turn in homework from last week, and and he would give he would just check it, correct, correct. And I I, I recognized that. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So this guy is going to give me a C, no matter what I do, whether I do the work, whether I don't do the work. All I have to do is show up. If there's homework, all I have to do is turn in the page. Just turn, just turn something in. If it look, if it's not English, if it's not history, if it's if I if it's if it's got your name on it and the date on it and it's set, then I'm gonna check it. So I was, you know, as a 15 year old, the absolute a free grade, a free C grade in algebra, 
I'll take it. I'll take it. Now, some of you may not have taken that. No, man, I don't want to go to college. But the day didn't have those aspirations. I just wanted to get out of high school. And so, oh, what, what is it? Check. All right. Yep, that's it. Oh, I'm going to give him homework from last week. Let's see what happens. Oh, yeah, I have to figure out just how far I can take this train. Oh, how, where does this go? It goes all the way to Coney Island. Really? I'm going to stay on the train because it goes all the way to Coney Island. So, oh, absolutely. This is last week's homework. Boom. Check. You did a good job, young man. Absolutely. If I don't do this work, what's going to happen? Nothing. Okay, well, I'm not going to do it. So, you know, we, 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 we don't benefit from thinking that that's what our faith is going to be like. Oh, it doesn't matter. So let's talk about two words, lies and lightness. The, the Lord, so one of the things I would like the brothers to, to, to understand and the sisters and the faithful in Christ Jesus who are watching this and those of you that are not yet faithful in Christ Jesus, Jesus wants you to be faithful. He wants you to do exactly what he's telling you to do so that you can be mighty. So one of the things I want us to grasp is the fact that sometimes hate feels like love. All right, so if Brother David had a topic for this talk, this segment of this talk, sometimes hate feels like love. All right, sometimes someone will act very lovingly toward you, but they actually hate you. And you're not going to necessarily pick up on the fact that they hate you. Because we're not talking about people who are flattering with their lips. We're not talking about people who, people who, who, who hate you and they think about your suffering and how that would benefit them emotionally. Oh, I hate you and I want bad things to happen to you. I want you to lose things. I want you to uh, fail at that. I want you to miss out on that. I think you should have something bad happen to you. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people who have affections for you, but because of their unwillingness to obey God, because they don't know how to treat you, they don't know how to help you, all they know is that they have a desire for your betterment, they, they want you to do better, it makes them happy. When, when you are happy, they are happy, all right? So, so they'll do things to make sure that you're happy. They'll do things to make sure that you're, you have a sense of peace. They'll do things to make sure that you have materials that you need to do whatever you want to do. So they'll, they'll, they'll encourage you. When you encounter them, they're here to encourage you. Sometimes hate feels like love. So when a person, the Word of God says, we know we love the brothers when we love God. So one of the brothers and I were talking about being affectionate when we're presenting the gospel. Brother Cornelius and I were talking about that. Being affectionate when presenting the gospel. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Brother Dave is going to be really nice right now. And uh, I'm going to smile and I'm going to, you know, do my hands in a very endearing way. And I am thinking to whatever extent the Lord will allow me to think this way. I am thinking that that's kind of what I should incorporate in some of my ministry. Uh, yes, so sometimes hate feels like love. Sometimes hate feels like love, man, because I am realizing that, and, and you say, David, no, man, you can't be doing that. But to be honest, you know, the Lord told John in Revelation 10, he said, come here. The angel of the Lord, the Lord said, go to that angel. He's got a book in his hand. Take the book and eat it. It's, and, then, and so John goes to the angel and says, give me the book, the, the little book that's in your hand, that's open in your hand. And the angel says, take it and eat it. In your mouth, it's going to be sweet. It's going to feel, you're going to feel it. It's going to make your stomach hurt. It's going to feel bit. You're going to, like it's going to burn your stomach. Either it made your stomach hurt or it burned. But, you know, yes, I want you to eat this. Eat this. It's going to taste sweet, though. It's going to taste very sweet, but it's going to make your belly, your, your belly bitter. Like, oh, man, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That made my belly bitter. Yes. Yeah, so, so it can be sweet because you can say really serious, drastic 
things with a smile if the Lord lets you, right? So, um, so, when we, so when we talk and we say that some, some people hate you, some people, some people hate you, some people think that they are actually encouraging you, but their encouragement is actually detrimental to you because you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. You are living in rebellion against God. And do you see how easy that is to take? Other than what Brother David might normally do, you know? God has blessed me with eyebrows, and I can look at you, you know? And one of the things that I'm glad that I got from my father are these, you know, eyebrow wrinkles, because it makes it more serious. Like, oh, this guy is serious. He's got several, you know what I mean? Like, oh, he's serious. Yeah, man. So if I say to you, listen, you're in rebellion. You're, you're, you're in rebellion with no smile, no smile. I just look at you like, hey, God's going to destroy you. You know, right now I can't do it, but give me a second. Yeah, so God's going to destroy you. I can't even do it. So that's not the purpose. So, what I, so we're not going to focus on that. What we'll focus on is the fact that so let's focus on that for a second. You, there are people who love you in their emotions. Like they love you emotionally. But because they don't know the will of God for your life, they're not helping you. They're hurting you. There are people in your life, your parents, some of them, your siblings, some of them, your spouses, some of them, your pastors, some of them, your coworkers, some of them, your neighbors, some of them, they're gonna tell you good things. They're gonna buy you things. They're going to support what you do. But if you're not doing what God wants you to do, their support for you while you are in sin is actually an act of hatred. They hate you. They're trying to destroy your life, but they don't know it. They don't know that they're trying to destroy your life. And they want you to have the job that you really want. They want you to get the degree that you really want. The clothing that you really want, the new iPhone, they really want you to have it. They want you to have the clothing. They want you to have the jewelry. They want you to have the job. They want you to have the car. They want you to have the accomplishment and the political position. They want you to be excellent, even though you're in rebellion, even though you, you don't love the Lord, you despise the Lord, or, at least, or you at least ignore him and put material things before him. But you've got, you've got a team of people on your side who are there to encourage you to keep doing what you are doing even though you're in rebellion against the Lord so sometimes hate feels like love now is this weird is that I just want to know if you think that's weird. like is that weird like man that's weird I can't differentiate between what you're saying and what you look like smiling telling me that I'm in rebellion because the reality brothers is that most of us are, uh, and not necessarily most of us that are watching this video right here, but most of us in our society are just living according to our personal ambitions and standards. So there are things that God wants us to do that most of us are unaware of because we aren't seeking to know his will. Essentially, we want God to help us. We want God to support us. And I was going to do a video uh, years ago, a message, video message years ago. I don't think I've done it. You know, we've done a lot of videos, and I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but I don't think I've done it. Um, the fact that, um, and I was going to call it the hip hop God. That's what I was going to call it. And I know, and I, and, and, and I wasn't going to call it the rock God or the goth God, the heavy metal God, the R&B God. I was going to call it the hip-hop God. And the reason why I was going to call the message the hip-hop God is because I, interacting with people 
who grew up religiously, who grew up under the Christian religion, the Christian faith, but were not committed to the Christian faith, I have discovered that there are societies, there are parts of society that, that grew up hearing about Jesus Christ, they grew up hearing about Father God, but they believe that God is good, the devil is bad, and by good, I don't mean good, I mean supportive. God supports you, the devil is against you. So the hip hop God was going to be a message that, seen, that focused on a group of people who believe that God is for them. Yes, God loves me, God is for me. It doesn't matter that I don't talk to him, that I work 60 hours a week and am too tired to go to church. I'm not too tired to work 60 hours a week. I don't tell my bosses that, hey, listen, my job, my hours are going to be conducive to my faith. You are not going to work me. I'm not going to accept the school schedule. I'm not going to accept any job position. I'm not going to take on any responsibilities in this life that stop me from spending the amount of time with Almighty God and the amount of time in the work of Almighty God that I am called to. I am not going to take, I'm not going to get so many bills that I've got to spend X amount of hours a week to make the money to sustain my my lifestyle, uh, what do you call it? My lifestyle, something like that. I forget what you call it. Like uh, my, 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 sons. my my life. Fine, we'll work we'll work with that. Uh, I'm not gonna work so many hours. I'm not gonna get into such deep debt that I've got to sustain my lifestyle. And so I've got to work two jobs. And you know, here's some money. Some of us are even brazen enough to give offering to people. Hey, listen, take this to church for me. Hey, grandma, or hey, wife, or hey, uh, kids, or hey, friend, are you going to church th today? Yes, I'm going to church today. Here, put this in there for me. Um, you send your offering. That's... So, I guess we have to evaluate whether we think God accepts that. Do you think that, like, so, is it like a child that you are responsible to. So you have a child, a man has a child. This man's name is Van. So the man's name is Van. Van was with Vandalin. No, that's not a good analogy. Van was with Farah. So Van and Farah had a child. They're not married or they were married, whichever. Van is not paying Farah for the child like he's supposed to. Maybe he is. Who cares? But Van doesn't go and see the child. Van doesn't go and see little Clarence, little VJ, Van, Van, Van Jr. He doesn't really go and see Van Jr. He just sends money. Here you go. 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 Here's some money. Every two weeks, every month, here's, here you go. Here you go. Hey, Farrah, give this. Uh, what does he need? Oh, he needs shoes. So here's some money for shoes. What does he need? He needs diapers. What does he need? He needs a jacket. What does he need? He needs a book bag. What does he need? He needs Van. That's what he needs. He needs Van. Um, he doesn't need Van's money as much as he needs Van. He doesn't need Van's money as much as he needs Van. So, oh, here's some money for him. 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 So that's a very small comparison to what we do with God. God, what do you want? You know, God, I'm actually too busy to work for you, but I'll tell you what, I'll support the house of God. Now, I'll tell you what, now, 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 now. In one sense, the, let me, okay, so I don't know how this is gonna sound to you and I say it, so I'll say it with a smile. In, a one, in one sense, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. So if the wicked wanna just give money to church and I don't know that you got that from stealing or the lottery or something crazy, listen man, put it in the offering. Jesus will send us internationally preaching this gospel, setting up kingdom churches internationally for the forwarding of the gospel. So we'll take your money and we'll use it for the gospel. If we know 
if we know that wait where'd you yeah now that's from this guy that's from brother van oh brother van i haven't seen brother van in three months he still sends offering yes did he move no he didn't move what's going on with him van is working and i mean you know the men of god might feel The men of God, the son, the sons, the sons of the living God might feel inclined. Give me that guy's check. Having a problem here. Oh, we'll deal with that in a second. We'll use the water. But you might want to burn the man's money. Fire's out. You might burn the man's money. You might burn the man's money in church, even if you have problems with it. You might burn the man's money. Because you don't want that money in the church. Wait a second. The guy's supposed to be here. Why isn't he here? Oh, he's not here because he's, he, he's got to work. Well, why did he send his money? Um, because he wants to support the kingdom of God. So, he wants to support the kingdom of God with money? Yeah. Well... But he doesn't want to be here? That's dirty money. That's, that's dirty money. That's not good money, man. That's dirty money. Now, if there's just money in the offering, we don't know who it came from. You don't just send money to church. You go to church. No, man, you go to church, man. You don't send money to church. You don't send money to church, man. You go, you, you go to church. You, you don't send money to church. church. Church needs you. The church needs you. The church needs you more than the church needs money. Now, I mean, you know, if you're going to miss a service, well, you know, you missed a service. You don't, no, you, no, no, you, 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 uh, you don't send money to church, man. You go to church. Do do you send money to the church because the church needs the money? Or do you send money to the church because you want God to continue to bless you in your idolatry? Lord, bless me. Bless me even though I ignore you. Bless me, Lord, even though I ignore you. Even though I'm in rebellion. Spirit of God. And as a matter of fact, I don't even think I'm in rebellion because the pastor doesn't think I'm in rebellion. The pastor tells me it's okay to just send money. And not show up. So, lies describe telling people to do things, or lies describe uh, telling people things that are wrong. Lightness, lies and lightness. That's what Jeremiah the prophet said about the Holy Ghost. Lightness describes not telling people the full truth. Let me. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Brother Dave, brother Dave, just burnt, almost burnt down the the set here. So let's get some word on that one right there because we need some word on that one. I want to read you something. I want to read the brother something out of Psalm 50. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down of it. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Our God will come and will not keep silence. A fire will devour before him like it almost devoured the platform here a fire will devour before him and it will be very tempestuous round about him he will call to the heavens from above to the earth that he may judge his people gather my saints together to me those that have made a, a covenant with me by sacrifice and the heavens will declare his righteousness for god is judge himself hear O my people and i will speak O israel and i will testify against you i am god even your God. 
I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings to have continually to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock. I hold on. Brothers, I'll, okay, so first, so, so what's Brother David saying, first of all? So, first of all, Brother David is letting the brethren know that God wants you more than he wants your money, right? So, God wants you more than he wants your money. So, for those of us who want to stay home and send money to church, according to Psalm 50, your money is dirty. I'm not saying that to be antagonistic. I'm not, Brother David's not trying to antagonize you. Anybody who, per, who, knows, who knows Brother Dave personally, you know. Brother Dave loves you, man. I'm not trying to antagonize you. I'm not going to lie on God's behalf. But we have two L issues here. We've got two issues with an L. Lies and lightness. Lies and lightness. So we've got people who are A, saying that things are true that are not true. And B, they are not telling the whole truth. So when we talk about God as supportive, oh, God is supportive. God is supportive. Of anything that you want to do oh yeah oh man I like that God and who is the devil oh the devil is against anything that you want to do so I want to I want to buy a car that I can't pay for listen God is on your side what about the devil the devil is against you the devil doesn't want you to have a new car the devil doesn't want you to have a college degree the devil doesn't want you to have to you know to have um, to win the Super Bowl the devil, that's the devil. He's against you. The devil doesn't want you to, you know, open your own business and to... So we, it doesn't even matter about the will of God for many of us. No, it's not about the will of God, man. It's about what I want to do. God is good, which means, so I translate good to mean supportive. The devil is bad. I trans translate that to mean he's against what I would want to do. So if I want to do something bad... If the devil's against me, or it, whatever's working against me, automatically automatically becomes the devil. Whatever, if I want to do something that I want to do, whether it's good or bad, whatever's for me is God in my mind, and whatever's against me is the devil in my mind. So that's the that's the confusion, brothers. That's where the lot. So so the Lord wants us to be free from that confusion. He wants us to be delivered, and so. We need to understand that God is on your side in that he wants you to have eternal life, in that he wants to make you like him, in that he wants to transform your mind, in that he wants to use you to be an, an instrument of love, absolutely, all on his terms. And I want to show you this verse right here. He says uh, in verse 9 of of, of of Psalm 50. Look at Psalm 50 verse 9. Give me a second. Hold on. I want, I want, can you see verse 9 right here? I will take no bullock out of your house, nor nor he goats out of your folds, for every animal of all the dollars or gods is mine. And the cattle on a thousand hills, I know the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, if I needed your money, I would not tell you for the world, hold on. And when I read that, I, I, that really impacted me when I first read that. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Yeah. If God was really, so the people will go and stand on the street corner and ask for donations for church. They'll do it. Oh, the church needs money. The people will go to the city in which their church is situated and ask the city people for money. Why? Something's wrong, brothers. And so, Pete, listen, he says, if God says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. So, as it relates to giving to God, giving money to God, but not your life, not your time, giving praises to God with your lips, but not with your life, no, brothers. He said, I, no, no, if I, were bro if, if I, God, were broke, I wouldn't tell you I'm God. I want you to focus on doing exactly what I tell you to do. I don't need, listen, if I were hungry, you think I want you to kill all, kill all of those animals because I'm hungry? Is that what's in your mind? No, 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 it's not about animals. It's about you. 
why does God tell me to give to the Lord? To give to the house of the Lord, to give to the work of the Lord. When I give to the house of the Lord, when I give to the work of the Lord, I'm giving to the Lord. So, why does God want me to do that? Because he says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So when I give material things to the Lord, it's an exhibition that that's where my heart is. But if that's all I give to God, if I give stuff to God, if I give material stuff to God, and I don't give my time, if I don't obey his voice, then, then I'm going to be counted as a hypocrite. He's going to say, David, you're a hypocrite. Well, Lord, how am I a hypocrite? I give to the church. I send my money to church every weekend. How am I a hypocrite? Because I didn't ask you for that. I think he's here. Hold on. Let's read verse 9. This is Psalm 50, verse 9. I will take no bullock out of your house, and I want to show you where else this doctrine is. This doctrine is in your Bible, my brothers and my sisters, and those of you who want to be my brothers and my sisters. The Lord is concerned about our perspective. He's concerned. He's concerned. He says something very, very, he says something very powerful in Jeremiah, where he says, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, it might be in um, Jeremiah chapter 7. Yeah, that's where it is. Jeremiah chapter 7, the Lord says something so powerful. I said, oh my goodness. This word right here is so sincere. Let me read this to you. I want to read this to you. This is this is Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 7 verses 21. Jeremiah 7 verses 21 on down says this. It says, it says, thus says, or this says the Lord of hosts of a multitude of people, the God of Israel. He says, put your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. Oh, you want to sacrifice to me, do you? You want to give some money to, to me, do you? Well then do it. Just accumulate it, build it up, put it all together. For I spoke not to your father. Now listen, listen, this is actually, this is not some new weird version. The, the message, the king, this is, this is the King James. Th listen, this is not some strange David altered Bible. I want to read this to you because we need to know that God is not as concerned with your behavior if your heart is disconnected from him and if your faithfulness to him from the heart doesn't manifest in your decision making so it's not about a partial give god some money relationship because i'll gotta you know say thank you by giving god checks or cash or some kind of you know e-transaction yet i don't go to church because i'm too busy how can you be too busy to go to church okay so so how can i be too busy to go to church but i'm not too busy to go to work i'm not too busy to go on vacation I'm not too busy to go to the store. I'm not too busy to go to the laundromat. I'm not too busy to go to the mail postal office. I'm not too busy. How can how can sons and daughters be too busy to go to church? Huh? How? How can you frame your mouth to say that without fear? that a meteor is gonna fall on you because it hasn't fallen on someone. That's why. Oh, there's no foreseeable consequence for my ignoring God and being too busy. I'm not saying that the Lord is commanding that you go to every service that the church has per se, depending on the call on your life. I'm saying within a seven day period, how often are you in the house of the Lord? Within, within the seven day period. How often are you in the house of the Lord? Oh, the Lord doesn't dwell in temples made with men's hands. No, brothers. That's not what he meant. Because as soon as Solomon finished praying that, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Give me a second, brothers. Give me a second. You would think, see, I know what happened. The devil has deceived many of us. And the deception makes us quote scripture, 
that keep us in rebellion. That's what, that's what it is, guys. There are scriptures that we pick and choose to be in rebellion. And if you, if you would have just read a little further, you would have realized that your perspective on that was pure rebellion. So, it says, Solomon says, even the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. That's what Solomon said. Solomon said, even the heaven of heavens can't contain you. How much, how much less this house that I've built for you? How much less this house? So, Lord, look down from your holy tabernacle and bless this house. Bless this house, okay? And as soon as he ended that prayer where he said, the Lord doesn't dwell in temples made with men's hands. You know what happened? The glory, the cloud, the presence of the Lord, the tangible presence of the Lord filled the house. And, the, and as a matter of fact, that was the second manifestation. That was, that was the second manifestation of the, pre, of the presence of God. That was, that, was, that was the second time. That's the second time. But what do you mean when you say the, when you say the glory? When you say the glory of the Lord? Yeah, the, 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 the tangible, apparent, visible cloud of God's spirit filled that place. Yeah. So God fills places. Jesus said that in, in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus, G Jesus said that in Matthew 18, brother. You believe that? You should, because it's actually in the Bible. But what, but, but what I, what I want to read to you here is this where it says, the Lord asks a question in verse 19. He says, do they provoke me to anger? It, do, do they think that that's what they're doing by saying stuff like, I'm too busy to go to church? How about leave work? What time is church? 7 p.m. Okay. Leave work. Like, leave. Leave class. Leave the hairdresser. Leave the barber shop. Leave the basketball court. Leave. Like, physically get up and walk out. I can't. Okay, fine, you can't today. Will you be able to tomorrow? We don't have church tomorrow. When do you next have church? Be there, just, just be there. Now, if you're not a son, you can go anywhere you wanna go. But if you're a son, according to Psalm 84, yeah, no, 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 no. If you're a son, sons, the, when the Lord said, hey, tell the people to come into the house, the people who didn't show up, the word of God says that he got angry. Right? It says God got angry. Like, what? Oh, they said they were too busy. The word of God says he got angry. Like, yeah, he got angry. God got angry. They didn't show up. He got angry. He got angry. So, you, you know you could just leave wherever you are and go. Like, you could just go. It's right there. You see it? You know the address? Have you, you, you Google it, put it in the navigation. Go to church. So, he said, they think they're provoking me because I told them that they were provoking. They're not, they're not provoking me. They're provoking themselves. They stand to gain from obeying me. I, I, no. Do they... do? Do they not, don't they provoke themselves to, the, to their own? Where does the confusion come from? The confusion comes from not knowing that the bad circumstances are a direct result of disobedience. Disassociative disorder. So I don't know that my disobedience is going to cause me pain and suffering. Yeah, man, that's, disasso that, that's confusion. I don't know that disobeying God today Three months down the line is going to cause that calamity. But for sons, he does, praise God, he doesn't wait that long. He doesn't wait that long for the sons. What did you do? You did that? Apologize. No? I'll see you in 24 hours. I'm going to visit your sin in 24 hours in measure. 
so that you, whoa, what happened? I'm glad, you, I'm glad I got your attention because as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And if I don't rebuke you, then you are a bastard and not my son. That's what he says in Hebrews chapter 12, right? We're not bastards. We're not illegitimate. We're sons. Sons don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Sons are not going to be wearied of God when he, when he rebukes. Hey, listen, I love you. Get over here and do this. Be excellent. Get over here and build something wonderful that I can fill, something that looks like me. That's it. We're not going to build anything that's wonderful with our own ideas. We're going to obey God. That's it, brothers. That, is that the word? So what does it say right here? Verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured on this place. Why? Because I do what I want to do. And I don't do what I'm told to do. Verse 21. Thus, verse 21. And, it, and it'll burn. And it'll not be quenched like that paper towel. Like, oh, it's hard to quench that fire. Yeah, man, you started it. It's going to burn. It's not going to be quenched. Thus said, thank God for the water, right? We have the water of the Holy Ghost on this side of things. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and eat flesh. Put your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spoke not to your fathers. This is one of the most powerful passages in your whole Bible. Okay, so I need you to understand what this is saying right here. For I spoke not to your fathers nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. And you say, wait a second. Yes, you did. That's exactly what you were talking to them about. The Passover, burnt offerings and sacrifices. And he says, listen to me. I did not speak to your fathers, nor did I command them anything that had to do with burnt offerings or sacrifices when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. You know what I said to them? This is what I said to them. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and walk you in all the ways, Jeremiah 7, 23, in all the ways that I, in all the ways, not just in the giving money to church ways, not just in the singing on the praise team ways, not just the being the doorkeeper ways, not just the, you know, having a Bible on your dashboard ways, wearing a bracelet way. No, 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 no. Walk in all the ways. Brothers and sisters, that's what the scriptures say right there. Look at that. Brother Dave is not making this up. It actually says that, that he, that, that all of Leviticus, all of the Exodus, all of Deuteronomy, all of Numbers, that had anything to do with burnt offerings was all saying one thing. Oh, Obey God. That's all it was saying. All it was saying, whenever he said, I want you to take the showbread and I want you to put it over there. And I want you to bake that every day. And I want the table of the showbread to be gold. And I want you to have candlesticks. And I want them to be of gold. And I want you to make this like this and do that like that. He said, you know what? I said nothing to you about any of that. You know what I actually said? All that law translated into one thing. Obey God. That's all I was saying to you. So you heard burnt offering. You heard put fringes on your... Uh, garments. You heard put a uh, 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 headdress on. You heard put a, an ephod on and make sure that you got the 12 stones and the Urim and the Thummim and the lights and put that in there. That's what you heard. That's not what I said. I know that's what you heard. You heard, remember, the Sabbath day. You heard, uh, don't eat the ostrich. Don't eat the eagle. Don't eat the pig. Don't eat the camel. So that's what you heard. That's not what I said, though. See, what you heard is not what I said. What I said was obey my voice. You heard burnt sacrifice. You heard linen. You heard, um, uh, 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 you know, an altar of whole stones and an altar of earth and three years and you know, three years of time. That's what you heard. That's not what I said. So when you want to pick and choose which parts of the Bible to obey, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm doing exactly what you're not doing what I told you to do. Yes, I am. I'm too busy to get to church. I've got this. I don't know why bad things are happening. The devil's against me. No, the devil's not against you. The devil, the devil, the devil is on a lot of our sides. I'll tell you that right now. The devil's on a lot of your side. 
I said, you, you, you want to know who's against your brothers if you do the stuff you shouldn't do? I want to show you something. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. This is James. This is James. Look at this right. What does that say right there? Verse 5. Oh, no, where is that? Verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, know you not, know you not the friend of the world, friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, what does that say? Is the enemy of God. That's what it says, guys. That's what it says. No, guys, I didn't talk to you about burnt offerings. I didn't talk to you about that. No, I said nothing to your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt about anything. Homosexuality, tattooing, don't prostitute your daughter, don't marry your, your, your aunt, don't marry your kids. That's not what I said. I said obey my voice. That's what I said, guys. All that you heard amounted to one thing. Obey my voice. So brothers and sisters, Jesus loves every one of us. And what's he saying? Obey my voice. Go to church. I'm too busy. Oh. Okay. Well, how are you going to avoid the consequence? That's Brother Dave's question. As your friend, my question to you is, how are you going to avoid the consequence of disobedience? How, how, how are you going to do that? Because it's coming. Either it's coming or God is a liar. Is God a liar? You know he's not a man that, you should, that he should lie. You know he's not a liar. So he's going to hold you accountable, not for what you make time for, for what he said that we ought to do. This is your brother David Williams of Jesus Ministries. God willing, we will talk within the next 24 hours.